Hey, this is Bethany. Hey, this is Tony. Hi, this is the cyberpunk android from the future, Nathan. So today we are going to be introducing the topic of plot points, an optional rule in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Sorry, guys, that Rachel wasn't with us for recording this episode, but she will be back for the next episode. Also, I am sorry for a few of the audio issues throughout this particular recording because of problems with my setup. So we fixed that and it won't be a problem going forward. On to the show. So, Nathan, uh, you brought us the topic, but uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you create? Ooh, self promo. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Yeah. So I produce two shows, two podcasts. Um, the one that's more important to y'all is my actual play podcast called The Talent Agency. It is a cyberpunk comedy based on various criminals for hire who do jobs in the world of arts and entertainment in the year 2077 in the UK. So it is all about going and stealing mixtapes from and from AI pop stars, um, going deep into the uh, magically infested woods to do a fashion photo shoot, um, to rescue a fashion designer from a corrupt fabric corporation all those kind of like out there stuff it's all loud it's all silly it's all incredibly queer um and you can find that on itunes and podbean um my other project is called passion project it is a uh, interview show that i do with lgbtq artists from across the world and across genre uh, where I find out that if they had infinite money, uh, infinite resources, and nobody to tell them no, what kind of impossible things that they would create. Um, that show is specifically part of a uh, online radio channel called Bunkazilla, B-U-N-K-A-Z-I-L-L-A.co.uk. Um, it airs every other Thursday. Um, because I know that you guys are an American show, um, it's actually UK locked, but if you go to the website, all the previous episodes are there to be listened to okay awesome very cool we sort of did a brief introduction to the topic but nathan if you want to explain why you proposed it okay so uh there is in the dungeon master's guide an interesting little page just a single page that talks about plot points a way for the players to have a uh, gm level narrative control over a game and the opening paragraph uh, has this sentence in, and it delights me because the tone of it is so different from the rest of the book. If your first reaction to reading this optional rule is to worry that your players might abuse it, it's probably not for you. And it's like, hey, hey, weak babies who aren't down for the improv, get out. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> this is for hardcore players only. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> to make a statement and immediately back down. That is the internet Nathan Blades way. Um, go, oh, right, oh, yes. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I don't back down very often, but uh, I, I will I will say that I am definitely not a hardcore casual split kind of person. But yes, I really do like that sentence of like, hey, there's a lot of different ways to play tabletop RPGs, and this is a big book about additional rules. And this is a rule. This is a rule that says you can ignore rules when you feel like, and that can be scary. But don't fear it. Embra embrace it. Embrace it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I run uh, Shadowrun Anarchy um, has plot points as an inherent part of the system. Everybody starts with three, and you can spend it to make something appear, to like jump in the way of a shot even when it's not your turn, to attack twice, to roll a glitch die, which makes you roll a d6. If you uh, get a five or a six, something good happens, regardless of the roll you just made. And if you get a one, something bad happens, regardless of the roll you just made. And that level of like additional kind of angles on something is really fascinating. Okay. Uh, RPing something where you did poorly, but something good happens, or even better, when you rolled well, but something bad happens anyway. Wonderful, delightful, love that stuff. I have to say, having read the rules in the DMG for the first time, I was in the, this is not for me category. This is partly because I was a new DM and with a lot of new players, it was my first time DMing anything. And I don't think it was so much a fear of the players abusing it, but more that it would sort of put them on the spot and they would feel unprepared. Because I think most times in my game, the players say, you take the wheel and kind of want me to run with it. And I would worry about putting them in a position where they would panic. So how about we go over the rules next? Essentially, um, 
when I first read it, it's like it sounds like a different version of like inspiration points, but it actually affects the story because each mm-hmm. player gets one. Um, so during the session, a players can spend that point to cause an effect. So the rules is written in the D and D book. Mm-hmm. Um, is the way that everybody gets a single plot point, and then once everybody has spent their plot point, all of them refresh. Right. Um, that does mean that if somebody is really reluctant to use their plot point, that then stalemates until somebody's like, hey, can you please use that so we can get them back? Or they can just be like, I hate plot points and won't use it, and then <laughs> nobody gets any more. Well, I suppose if someone wants to opt out of plot points, they can, right? If yeah. they're like, it's not my thing, uh, I really encourage you guys to do it, but it's not for me, that I that I understand. I yeah, do no, think... I there's a sense of a certain type of player. Uh, my brother is just starting to play D&D, but I know he's a hoarder of okay. not just stuff, but options. So I know he'd be mm. like, no, 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 man. I got to save this plot point for when it's really bad. Like, things are okay right now. But uh, like, oh, I yeah. might need that. Trap. Well, he'll do it. Half the party is dead. You know, <laughs> they're fighting some massive creature. Um, he's, you know, bloodied and, and nearly beaten down. It's like, but there might be something worse there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So He's maybe the kind that's the person who plays JRPGs and keeps their max elixirs. Uh, uh yes. It I forget which game it was. It was some like red alert. Oh yeah, it was like an old FPS I was playing with him and I we got to the point where we're having to take down a helicopter. And he's like, No, 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 don't use the rocket launcher. That's for like the big <laughs> stuff. You're gonna use the pistol because it has unlimited ammo. And I was like, oh Are you God. kidding me? Twenty minutes later we take down the helicopter and I'm like he gets through the rest of the game. I'm like, So did you use the rocket launcher ammo? And he's like no, um, didn't end up coming up. But if it had, I would have been ready. <laughs> oh my goodness, 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 goodness. So maybe some of that is just getting past that expectation of it's a, it's a get out of jail free card, right? Mm, mm. And just see it as more of a tool that's in your your arsenal that you can deploy. But then we'll come back. Mm. Uh, the options they kind of given this is like you create a twist, which uh, the example is your and your player characters as you're searching all of a sudden find a secret door you used your point to say hey i found this secret door Hmm. Uh, another option they do is not just oh you found a secret door but you the there's a magical trap on it that could cause us to teleport to another part of the dungeon Uh, Um, like a different player gets to make that that choice so the whoever does the uh oh i found the secret door the player to their right then has to create a complication in order to kind of fit in, you know, with what's going on. Uh, the third option they give is just uh, you, you switch who DMs. You spend your plot point, and then that person who spent it is now the new DM until someone else spends a plot point. And that one's wild. That yes. actually fascinates me. Yeah, that yep. one's called The Gods Must Be Crazy, a reference to the excellent film, The Gods Must the Be God Crazy. Must be crazy. <laughs> I, I would think- love to do that. As the um, I, while I'm not necessarily a high fantasy or D and D person, I would love to play th- because everybody, excuse me, everybody's DM style is so different. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you manage to kind of like get pull the lottery wheel and find people that work with you, um, narratively improv wise, and are also DMs who have a different DM style, the kind of story you could tell would be so cool, so cool. I have to say that third option is the one I find most exciting, but also scary, because I've co dm before with Rachel, and our styles are completely different. We have different perspectives on story and gameplay, but they really complement each other, and we work well together. So I think I would love to do that for a one-shot, but not for a campaign, because... Oh gosh, no, that's a one-shot. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. well, from, from like a producing standpoint, because uh, as, you, as you guys must also absolutely know, the yeah. kind of changes you have to make when you're doing something for general consumption um changes what you can and can't do Mm -hmm. so heavily uh i would definitely maybe only do that as a one shot rather than a campaign but if it was something that wasn't mic'd i would probably do the gods must be crazy like anytime i play (laughs) dmd as long as you get people who are really into it and willing to do a little bit of prep i think it's great because it takes pressure off the dm because imagine like a if you've ever done stuff like a game jam or stuff before where there's like a theme that you produce an item to, um, say you and three other DMs did like Journey to the Feywild as your core conceit, and then you went away and kind of thought about what you would make that be personally, and then you got to have a mashup of all those different ideas together in one story. Just that kind of like... And yeah, especially if the setting can really drive the narrative, right? Where it, yeah. you're all kind of operating in the same space and you might have a different understanding of it 
details, but fundamentally you all kind of know where you are. Because mm-hmm. uh, D&D has a, a relatively large emphasis on encounters. Mm-hmm. So um, having the time to think of an encounter to put together would be really important for the gods must be crazy, I think. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. if it's your turn as a DM and you as a person aren't really good at putting together encounters on the fly, and that is a really difficult skill, I definitely can't do that. Um, you would want the advanced time to think about it. So I think that might be the bit of the planning caveat to make that work in a practical sense, but as a conceit, as a concept, that is so fascinating. I guess one of my questions I had was, what are the advantages of using plot points? We've kind of already mentioned like how that could help with diminishing your prep yes. as a DM, but what are some mm. other things that, that stand out to you, Nathan, especially, and why you're like, plot points, let's talk about it! Oh, gosh. What I've found is that um, the... the, the um, the plot points for D&D are specifically not combat ones, or at least the examples that they give are kind of like narrative exploratory ones. Um, and in that sense, it gives the opportunity for stuff like alternate puzzle solutions mm-hmm. and things like that. Um, as they write, like, you just find a door, feels like a cop-out if you were doing like a Tomb of Horrors thing, and it's like, oh, you mm-hmm. can just like, step outside of this puzzle. But, yeah. you know, if you're playing with the right people who have an idea in their head about how this plot how this puzzle solving should go or a way that you can make it more interesting, giving them the ability to kind of um, express their opinion of how this could be more interesting. Cause you know, as a, a, a DM writing is a very solitary experience. It's very difficult to send your GM notes to other people and be like, is this bad? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely can't send it to your players because that's the moot point. Yep. And uh, talking about, I always find that talking about your RPG achievements to other people is like talking about your dreams to other people with no context. It's just an abstract mess that you want to indulge into other people. So uh, you should come visit our Discord because this is a big part of what we do. <laughs> it's just talk about our nonsense. <laughs> it's like I don't have the literal dozens of hours of game time that have built up to make that one moment epic for you. So I'm just gonna like be like, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it's uh, awesome. But yes, uh, the the idea of letting other other players kind of add in their idea of what they think is awesome. And to be honest, if you're playing with other people and you don't think that they have ideas to make your show, because let's just embrace that wholeheartedly, interesting, why are you playing with them? Well, so I could give like a couple of points on that. One is, I think uh, I've been really cautious in using the rules. And part of the reason Tony and I have been so rules as written is because we have been in recruiting mode for for. D&D in general, oh, yeah. and trying to bring in new players. So it helps when you're like, look, don't be nervous. Look at all this structure. Because I think a lot of people are spooked by the idea of like being put on the spot. I would say that's pretty common in our particular group of players because overall we're mm. mostly introverts. Not that we're all shy or uncomfortable, but we kind of like to get the lay of the land before like putting ourselves out there. So I mm-hmm. think that's part of it is like a, just a comfort thing. Like not that I don't feel people have good ideas, but they're like, oh man, like I have to like produce. I thought I was here to just like engage with what you tell me. So I think Mm, mm. part of it is just sort of like adjusting that mindset. Uh, But another point I was going to say is I know the idea of plot points is a little nerve wracking for me as someone who like super prepares my sessions. But in another Uh. sense, I think a lot of DMs, we sort of do number one. We just don't tell the players we're doing it where they're like, oh man, wouldn't it be cool if this happened? You're like, Mm-hmm. Mm, well, oh, funny well about that. <laughs> yes, exactly as I planned all along. <laughs> no, I feel you. That's def- those are <laughs> two very, very good points. Um, especially with regards to kind of putting people on the spot for improv. I, I guess I wouldn't um make newbies to tabletop jump in. At oh. the same time, though, newbies are really, really good at thinking up solutions that if you don't have years of training about how tabletop RPGs are supposed to go you wouldn't think of those solutions in a million years and plot yeah. points I think are a really good way to give them the opportunity mm-hmm. to make those ideas known I think it's that problem we have where some of us are trained to look for the right answers in yes. a sense we're like I know I know what kind of problems I'm going to face I know what or maybe the best answer I know what the best answer is to this problem <laughs> or the best solution when maybe the best story doesn't come from the best answer <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, so I think in a sense, maybe some of it is just getting out there and going for it. And if it 
fails horribly, it is just a game. Someone's uncomfortable for a little bit. Mm -hmm. No one is going to literally die from embarrassment. But I think, uh, in general, I'm perhaps like a bit of a, like a bit of a mom as a DM, where I want, is everybody having a good time? Everyone happy? (laughs) They would need a snack. (laughs) Like, (laughs) trying to like, are we all good? Is anyone uncomfortable? Do we need to talk about this? Like, is there anything I could do to make? Yeah, like that's that's partly just me. I think that's mm. how, how I DM. And I have six players, so I just want to like, is everybody happy? Everybody good? All right, let's just keep moving forward. Yeah, um, you have a lot of pace <laughs> to spin in that regard, and I can see why you want to kind of keep yeah, going. Yeah, but even, even kill. Having, having just studied up on Dungeon World, I'm like, this is something I can do better with. I think I need to embrace it a bit more. And mm. I'm glad you brought up plot points. I was like, oh, great. This kind of ties into kind of like key mechanics in Dungeon World, which is a lot of like, just going to the players and going, what's this like in the world you tell me <laughs> definitely um having run sis- have you ever like uh, off the off the hand this is maybe a little bit related of like systems that are so freeform they don't need plot points because that how that's how it is um if you've ever played a system where you've not written any notes at all for it oh. <laughs> <laughs> no documentation <laughs> yeah um, i recently did uh, a session of hack the planet um written by grant howitt who did honey heist Mm-hmm. That's a pretty famous one because I think the people on Critical Role did a couple of sessions for that. Yeah, <laughs> they did. Um, Hack the Planet is based on the movie Hackers, which is a fantastic movie you should go and see if you haven't seen it already. But it's basically uh, edgy teens fight the man by doing computers inaccurately. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Lots of typing, right? <laughs> Lots of typing while uh, talking about jumping the mainframe uh-huh. and inserting a Cerberus virus yeah. into the firewall and so on and so forth. Um, but that, because of, the, because of how that works, I came into that session with a vague idea of what the man, quote unquote, would be doing. Um, I, I think in my head it was the, this media company doing like an esports thing. Uh, that gathered player data from pe- that gathered like informational data from its participants and used it for crimes. Um, oh. But one of the players then said that they are a big gamer and really want to get into esports. And I'm like, oh, the media company would absolutely have an esports game that they're doing evil things with. This is what the story is about now. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this is what I planned all along. This is great. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. Um, I'm I am very willing to part the curtain and be like, that was a surprise. Cause <laughs> I, I think players in this you know, like players get uh satisfaction from lots of different things. And I think that's kind of why plot points exist actually, is to codify a system where if you are satisfied about having a direct impact on the story outside of lucking out on the dice roll this is for you of being able to kind of take the spotlight and cook and crafting this game world but that was a moment of unspoken plot points like i didn't need to give him permission to say that this thing would be about video games but it was and he was happy and i was super happy because i was able to kind of redirect where the story was going in my brain to where it was supposed to go and at the times where it is difficult, when uh, when plot points go bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that ties into one of my questions is, uh, do you think there's additional ground rules you have to establish? Because the rules, at least for 5e, are pretty loose. Like, here are our ideas for plot points. Use them how you will if it's good for you guys. I mean, yeah. Cool. yeah, like, whatever. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, what, what, do you, what would you place any restrictions? Because I, I know I would place, or guidelines maybe would be the better word. Yeah, yeah. I, I think a lot of these kind of things is playing by ear. Um, you've probably already already had circumstances where a player narratively is like, "I want to punch the queen," and you you as a DM be like, "We're just going to stop playing for a second and talk through what the thing is you want to do and why you want to do it, and then maybe dissuade you from doing that idea if it would make the story less fun." Yeah, and that's just a thing that happens even without a mechanics giving them the ability to punch the queen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I find plot points are quite similar. Yeah. And that somebody wants to go and do something to the story. And I'll be like, that is something that the mechanics will let you do. But I will say that this will make the story more complicated if this happens. Or this thing that you want to do will shut down what this character is good at. And things like that. It's like, ah. Oh, I am all for you taking control of the story, but if it's impacting on the fun of other people, I will break narrative just to be like, hey, maybe let's not. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I used to 
at it from the angle of, so what are you trying to accomplish here? Let's yeah. let's work through what the goal is, and then maybe see if we can get there, you know, a different way. Uh, but I'd say overall, I don't do that very much as a DM, because I think I'm really committed, uh, this will seem weird, to like character agency over player agency. So I sure. often let these things go. And even when I'm like, this is going to be bad, I can try to solve it in within the game fiction. I guess my question was about how uh, I guess the the sort of the game fiction, the internal coherence of the world should drive the plot points. Yes, I, I do. I do think that's definitely true. I, I think probably something that would uh, hard rule out a plot point would be something that doesn't make sense within game fiction. Um, by running something high fantasy, for example, you would find it very difficult to have somebody spend a plot point and be like, I find a telephone, <laughs> unless you are very on the fly or you have uh, a world where magitech is kind of commonplace. It's like, oh, you find a stone of far speech or a crystal ball and that's the telephone and you kind of work together to kind of work out how this idea works in fiction. I am very lucky by doing something set in the modern world. It's really easy to think of things that could occur but are feasible within a modern sci-fi context, which is which is why I guess I get to uh, embrace plot points so heartily because it's quite difficult to break the fiction when the fiction is so close to our modern world. Um, but when the level of tech is like, we have electricity, but we can't use it to power things, uh, <laughs> that sets a hard cap on what you can and can't do with stuff that exists in the game world. Uh, <laughs> so yes, I can definitely see that being being a a problem. I am, I guess, yeah. I, I'm lucky in that nobody suggested something that can't be done in my game world. Um, well, but also, yeah, I, I guess I wouldn't be as a player being like, oh yes, I find that the wizard was designing a rocket ship. <laughs> <laughs> well, and maybe that's because I think overall, at least most of the people I've played with want to play well. You know, we want to be good players and good people and good friends to those around us so we're trying to do a good job of like maintaining the coherence of the story and engaging with the world especially so maybe... as, yeah the uh producing for uh for radio <laughs> right, so yes. Mm -hmm. yes yeah that we're we all want to i don't want to say perform what would be the right way to say that tony um role play yeah we all want yeah. to role play well <laughs> we want to be the, these characters yes so looking at the questions here really quickly, um, I guess we talked about it a little bit, but I guess how would you use plot points to prep for a session? I, I guess I can kind of take it back to that and say I'm definitely resisting my inclination to be a DM that's, I don't want to say a control freak because that sounds bad, but mm. uh, hyper structured where I have like not just, I don't have it mapped out like I'm railroading them, but I'm like, I have this world where I built out the stuff that's going to happen. I have all these interesting people that I really want them to meet so that they can give them little tidbits of the overarching story. Um, and then Tony points out that I have the tendency to try to create my plots like they're a soap opera where everything's interconnected and it all gets really ridiculous by the end, which has totally happened in my current campaign. It's happened several times. But sometimes it's great, you know? <laughs> yep. Uh <laughs> A character that a player has thrown away into the world, and then you have summoned them back later for some telenovela. Then, ah, <laughs> oh, beautiful. beautiful. <laughs> well, um, even better if it's a character I've thrown away, and they will not let them go. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, now they're utterly important to the entire narrative. That You're getting what by you want. Default. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely by by having. Um, letting my players telephone because i have a world that lets my players do that mm -hmm. any previous npc that does not hate them <laughs> and how they have used that to solve problems before real cool but um yes that definitely does affect how i write my notes as a dm mm -hmm. uh, unless i'm doing something particularly complicated like said murder mystery where um character backstories and actions and clue availability is really important to making that session work correctly so that had a lot of notes to it but usually i write somewhere between one to three or maybe four paragraphs per scene and three scenes and that is all my gm notes oh and then like stat blocks if right right yeah right. yeah, yeah all your crunchy but, number stuff yeah 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 but yeah it's more kind of like what's going where they are uh who is going to be there and if there are any kind of major things that need to happen to make the plot work um like 
you go into this place and it turns out that the treasure that you were looking for was actually a killer robot oh no so that has to be written down so i remember to mention that there is a killer robot what the killer robot looks like but for the most part it's quite open uh it does it does mean that stuff can uh vacillate and wibble around a little bit uh until i got better as a dm because i guess i've been dming uh on mic now for a year Congratulations! Yep. <laughs> uh, Made it. <laughs> yeah, the, the podcast as as has has existed has been going for six months, but I've been stuff was recorded before the time it's been going on there. But uh, yeah, uh, sometimes it means that if I don't write lots of things to keep things on track, then that leaves a window for the players to use plot points and their own imagination to wander around and do whatever there is definitely an episode of my podcast that runs for an hour that is two conversations with two people oh i i think we've all been there <laughs> it was great uh but yes yes uh plot points are anti-structure so you kind of have to go in with not making as many uh moving parts as necessary and then the times where you want to have lots of moving parts, like the murder mystery, you might just have to mention to your players, like, hey, this is a murder mystery. You can't use plot points to automatically solve the murder because that's dumb. So maybe we're just going to not use as many plot points in this circumstance. And they're like, oh, yeah, because I want to tell a cool story. So we'll play ball if you're open about it. So I guess my question would be kind of, we kind of talked around it, but haven't gotten at it directly. Sure. The idea of the game being a challenge, because I'd say I think in general, most of our players, well, it's a mixture of people who are like, I'm just here to role play and have fun. People who are like, I want to be challenged. I want to overcome and I want to feel like a hero, which is mm. why we play traditional fantasy. So do you think there's a risk with using plot points of that being diminished? Or do you think that that sense of like overcoming a challenge and being heroic is actually like helped by plot points? That's actually really interesting. I personally am really... I, I think my weakness is doing D&D level challenging combats. Not that my stuff is combat free. And in fact, my combats have sometimes been almost very nearly, but not quite lethal. Uh, so there's still a lot of dramatic tension in there, but not that kind of like heroic style combat-y stuff. Mm -hmm. Um I would be very, excuse me, I'd be very impressed to see somebody use plot points to change the state of battle, because I, I think, uh, going back to earlier about what kind of plot point things you would rule out, um, I would, for example, rule out somebody saying that there is like a loose cable that somebody trips over, because yeah. that's like directly affecting the mechanical combat in a way where you didn't have to do anything to make yourself generate an advantage but for example if i was like uh i spend a plot point to say that in this kitchen that we're fighting in we have a lot of metal trash cans in the corner and then i'm going to do a thing where i'm going to electrify one of them and use it to shock somebody so it's then using the plot points to make the game space Mm -hmm. advantageous for a cool thing i am doing and then <laughs> that's red you know that's 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 making the game fiction more interesting to give yourself a combat advantage which you may still fail well yeah uh, yeah there always has to be the risk of failure otherwise i think the whole point of not just the game being dnd &D, but like sort of that gaming in general is if you're auto automatically succeeding at everything then there's no sense of yeah, if you're yes. automatically winning, what's the fun? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and even then, that can go to the lengths of if the mechanics make this really easy, you being willing to make your life more difficult. Um, one of the uh, listed, like in the rules as written books for the Sh Shadowrun Anarchy of something you can spend a plot point for, is to summon additional threats, which seems really counterintuitive. Uh, yeah. Kind of like combat standpoint, it's like, oh, why would I be in combat and then summon more guards to fight? <laughs> that's <laughs> bad but then also for example if you were doing an infiltration and you need to go and summon some guards so you can knock one out and steal their outfit uh, uh, yeah it's uh that's that's the cool bits about plot points yeah where it's all kind of like oh this makes it more dramatic but this also gives me an opportunity to do things in a way that my character would work with really well uh one thing i would be cautious of that kind of 
ties back to what you were talking about way earlier. I wouldn't, I would make sure plot points aren't being used to control NPCs. I mean, I like the idea of it working in a way that sort of influences, but not to say this person is going to do what I want. Because yeah. I think that sort of, even though we all know as players, they're NPCs, they're not real, you know, they're just here to serve our narrative. I don't think that's, I think it's something a lot of people feel about NPCs when they're playing, when they're new to the game but kind mm -hmm. of diminishes the whole point of building a narrative in the space which is in a sense they're just as important as you are mm. you know and i they, think they exist in the world and have lives outside of you ideally um... <laughs> ideally <laughs> so i yeah. think i like the idea more of the influence part which, which is what you were kind of describing I think if you want to make a really easy ground rule of what you can use plot points for is making objects appear mm -hmm. in the space, mm -hmm. I think is the easiest, simplest thing you can use a plot point to do. Um, ignoring stuff like uh, uh, Shadowrun's rules where you can spend plot points to like leap in the way of attacks that are not targeted at you or like attack somebody who just hit you and things like that that go into actual like combat -y things, but within a space where it's still acceptable. Um, like yeah, if you were if you were like, oh, I don't know what to spend with my ability to control the story, make something appear, and that thing can be used for all sorts of purposes. Especially if, um, and you're playing with the kind of team that likes to do teamwork things, the best use of a plot point is summoning something that will help your friend. Hey, yeah, yeah. and I think for me, it honestly does make sense with a certain aspect of my DMing, which I'm very description light. Um, I feel like if I'm describing it, it needs to be important. If it's not important, I don't describe it in yeah. in sort of the way the world is. So I think in a sense, it could be like, oh, that was there all along. I just didn't describe it to you. So it doesn't have that sense of like, it appears, but it was there all along. We oh, just yeah. hadn't noticed it yet. Uh, yeah. So I think that could kind of work with that whole approach. Uh, but that's just a personal thing for me. I try to think what else we have that we'd want to go over. I think we answered all of my questions Ooh -hoo. beyond, I suppose... I need to actually try using plot points now. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, I've... yeah. Please do. Give me a trip report on how your plot points go. Yeah, or no. Oh, yeah. No, we need to do like a one shot or something. Hmm. So I guess that's kind of everything. Usually we try to do a wrap up. Did you want to wrap up kind of what we discussed? What have we learned? What have we learned? What what's our, what's our sitcom moment where we if... can all sit down and say, what did we learn today? Well, we kind of always determined that uh, a lot of the different things, we recruit a lot. So with newer players that aren't used to that level of freedom in manipulating a story and that level of choice maybe this isn't the thing but plot points can be an amazing way to kind of get some really cool moments really cool interactions mm -hmm. with the world itself and cause a real difference in the world that is not just the dm in the dm's control mm-hmm all right. Do you have any information you want to share? Like, if you want to tell me what robots you like to smooch, go and talk to me on my regular personal Twitter. That's at Writer Blades, and that's also my Instagram. Uh, if you want to tell me how uh, wonderful my uh, podcasts are, and or if you want to tell me there are audio errors that I should immediately <laughs> fix, um, you can talk to me on my actual podcast Twitter at Phantom Arts Ent E N T um, on Twitter. Yay. Yes, please, please listen to my show, The Talent Agency. It's available on iTunes and Podbean. Um, yeah, and even if you have terrible things to say about it, I cannot voice act. Please tell me that I can't voice act because it's life affirming. Please do that. <laughs> Twitter handle at Phantom Arts Ent. Tell me how bad I am at this thing so I can get better. Well, this brings us to the rest of our interview questions. So, how did you get into tabletop role playing games? Oh my god, um, it's weird. I actually have been playing TTRPGs for a surprisingly long time. Um, I uh, got my first TTRPG was when I was in sixth form, which for oh. Americans would be like when I was between 16 to 18, just before getting into uni. Uh, we played GURPS, um, which stands for like what generic universal role playing system. Um, it's really maths heavy, and I do not recommend it. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we had a lot of the rule books, so you know. Um, we played a little bit of Cyberpunk 2020, um, and yeah, it was it was kind of my first foray into doing that kind of thing. I don't remember whether I did well at it or not. That's like a different. Uh, I, I guess accolade. Um, to, to be fair, none of us ever know if we do well. I always am trying to do well, and then in retrospect, I'm like, I, I don't know. I did stuff, so mm, mm, I tried really you, hard. I was you don't engaged. really get feedback at the time, especially <laughs> like you know, you're still a teenager and you don't know how to give or take criticism particularly well. Um, 
then I played a lot in university. Um, I played Dungeons and Dragons for the first time. It was 3.5 ed. I chose to be a rogue bard who did nothing but drink and gamble, setting a kind of tone for every character I've played <laughs> since then. Um, it turned out that there was another bard in that group because I joined when they'd already played a couple sessions. He did not enjoy the fact that there was another bard joining the party and wanted to become an assassin. And apparently the way you become an assassin in 3.5 is to kill a major character. So he killed me in my sleep. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. I know, uh, right? Uh, but I got my revenge. I, I looked through the different splat books for 3.5. There is one about role-playing a ghost. I talked to my DM, can I be a poltergeist? He said, yes, the fool. Um, and I came back as a ghost and trashed all his instruments. And yes. then he, uh, he stopped playing. And then I re-rolled a druid who made lots of tea. And it was great. <laughs> um, all his spells I flavored as he brewed tea as potions and threw the tea at people. It was great. Um, I didn't really know how to play tabletop RPGs, how they're supposed to be played, but that was fun. And I guess that's how I've kind of remained in my approach to tabletop RPG since then. Um, modern era tabletop RPG stuff. I moved to Manchester two years ago, um, had to make a new friendship network, uh, joined the tabletop RPG of uh, Paolo Grinelli. Um, he is one of the members of staff at Traveling Man, which is a one of your local, what's the LLG, uh, what's the acronym? Local gaming, friendly, lo FLGS. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> yes. friendly local go. gaming store. <laughs> hmm, I got there in the end, sorry. But yes, uh, he, he yes. works at my friendly local gaming store. Um, we play Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition with a handful of different people, with six players initially, which was, intense <laughs> uh i'm still not quite sure if i, I well no I, I definitely know i don't like playing along five alongside five of the players at the same time it's a mess um but... yeah, I, I run six players wait is it six players how many of there are you now there are six my players. yeah there's six of them <laughs> how do you do that <laughs> with um, great difficulty with great difficulty and a couple of them are pretty quiet so oh, I, I just have to soon. i just have to make sure like, the quiet ones get a chance to talk <laughs> and I don't know. Everybody gets along pretty well. It, ha it has to be the right group. Oh god, yeah. Social dynamics is so important to making uh, tabletop RPGs work, especially ones that are very improv heavy. But yes, being able to kind of think on the same wavelength as the kind of story you want to tell definitely helps. Um, that particular group was a mixture of people who are like me and are all about kind of improv a space, and other people who are really interested in really uh, technical and well-performed combat, which is what D&D is really good at. D&D is incredibly good at making um, really tactical combat scenarios. And yeah. so there was a bit of conflict in how those kind of mesh together, but we've made it through. But it got me to be interested in playing tabletop RPGs again, you know? Uh, and I had like an idea knocking around in my head for um, uh, doing an RPG circumstance, or maybe it was like a video game thing, you know, where those kind of ideas kind of could be any different types of medium. But I had right. this idea of uh, a pop star AI who is also the security system of a corporation, and what fighting it would be like. And I'm like, that's sick. I should do that. That'd be like, grand. I need to make that a thing. If it's not a thing, it needs to be a thing. <laughs> and then the talent agency was born. And that's where I am now, uh, making AI pop stars fight for my entertainment. So that pretty much answers our next question of how did you get into podcasting? It just happened. Yeah, I, I did a little bit of, I've actually uh, been a little bit in the game for podcasting for a while. Um, when I lived in London, um, there is a, a gaming community that was initially called DS London, like DS, like the games console, uh -huh. um, ran 10 years, like a big kind of like local gaming community where you could go and play multiplayer games and pubs and cafes and stuff like that. Uh, they've since become Switch London because times have moved on. Um, but yeah, I, upgrade to the latest. <laughs> I, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, old brand, old brand. But I, I joined their podcast. Um, they they had uh, a podcast. I was like, oh, I'll check that out. Oh, everybody's opinions are really bad. So oh, I, I instead. You're like, I feel like there's some voices missing from this space. I could be one of those voices. <laughs> I will admit that they did have a token black person on the podcast previously before I joined. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> 
wasn't the I hope that wasn't the entirety of that whole. Oh gosh, no, 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 no. I, I joke about it because I'm allowed to, but uh... yes, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I go whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on here. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, like Har- Harrison is is a darling. Uh, he doesn't do the show anymore. He's he's an adult and has other things to do with this time. I'm that's technically fair. an adult, but I don't believe that really. Um... <laughs> yeah, that's us those days. But I'm like some days I'm definitely adult. Like this morning. We went and got new driver's licenses. I was like, man, we're doing great. And then now we're doing this. So, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's a mixed bag. Nine to five on a weekday, I'm an adult. And it's <laughs> yeah. only sometimes. But <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I've been podcasting a couple years in the game and then took that uh, ability to edit audio and have it not sound like a potato mm-hmm. and um, turn that to actual play podcasting. Yay. Yeah. yeah. I think that's great. And I think that's. I don't even know how ours has been a weird evolution and journey where it was first like one of our friends was like, we should do a podcast. And we're like, yeah, which I realized we should do a podcast is like the equivalent of the previous trope of we should be a band. Uh-huh. Like, <laughs> that is the millennial version of yeah. we should be a band. That's true. Well, oh so my gosh. Table, and then we're like, yeah, and then we start doing it. I'm like, we have no idea what we're doing or why we're doing it beyond maybe hoping something we make will be something someone somewhere will uh, I guess you also kind of avoid the the classic joke. Uh, what do you call three white men in the microphone? Oh. <laughs> yes, I just told Tony that joke, and I was like, <laughs> um, "To be fair, of the podcast I have listened to, I would say that's probably seventy percent of them." <laughs> mhm, mhm. I mean, like even like the McElroy brothers are darlings, and I love them all individually. Oh, no. Like Travis, I love slightly more, but I won't tell the others that. But. Um... <laughs> He's such a bear, goodness. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> but That's fair. Yes, yes. Uh, it, is, it is a commonplace thing. I tell that joke relatively often, and the results of that joke have been mixed. <gasps> oh. Do some people resent it? <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, but I, I, I must say, like, white male fragility is super a thing, and even when, like, they're woke in the grand scale of things, some people go like, hmm, that joke stung. Yes. yes <gasps> oh, I mean, I try to check my privilege regularly. I wouldn't say I'm a hundred percent, but uh podcasting it's it's pretty it's pretty extreme when you look at the numbers. And even like now when we look at like our our stats for like our listeners and our Twitter followers and stuff, and I'm like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh. We really like, we love our listeners that. and Twitter followers, don't get us wrong. Oh yeah, like, you're great. <laughs> all the white boys can follow me, that's fine. <laughs> But we'd love to see more people from different backgrounds. <laughs> mm, mm, for real. I guess that's another reason why I'm kind of so um, willing to do podcasting. Uh, I don't know if you've ever kind of heard the term of like when you um, talk about, say, like, ah, oh, we would love more women in film. And yep. then people be like, hey, well, be the change that you want to be. Why don't <laughs> you make those women's with films? Is is? And I'm like, sure. I have to do all the work and then literally every white dude can just sit there and a movie comes out for them. <laughs> they don't have yeah. to do nothing. No, no, no. no I, I agree. It's definitely been a similar thing with being a woman in like the tabletop role playing space where things are better. Things mm. are not there yet. And I think sometimes there's a perception of we're doing so much better. We're there. We've made it. <laughs> oh God. Like absolutely. <laughs> like uh, POC and queer people and women like been in tabletop rpgs for time it's oh, yeah. just we weren't in the advertising and that causes like a negative feedback loop so i guess uh-huh. this is our attempt at reclaiming that space like making sure that um, especially in sci-fi since that's my my well uh, high fantasy has its own issues with kind of like oh, uh, yeah. race and gender and sexuality and that's kind of the reasons why i've bounced off it so hard across the years but even within sci-fi the kind of um general image of cyberpunk mm-hmm. is this grizzled white dude like <laughs> smoking in the rain and there's like some neon lights somewhere and then maybe there's like some big ai titty like a, a hologram with big boobs well, and there's and also that's cyberpunk well, now oh it's like as this guy is also thinking about like oh the death of my wife and child and you're like uh-huh. oh. so you talk about cyberpunk a lot and you know we got into the d 5e but that leads us a little bit into our next question of what is your favorite RPG system to play? Oh my god, that question is actually really hard. That's so, why it's one of the last ones, yeah. yeah <laughs> we want to start yeah. with the easy ones. <laughs> um, I, I don't get the luxury of saying, like, my first RPG, because, you know, um, mm-hmm. 
nerds like to color their like taste experiences and the thing that they enjoyed first and then everything new is weird and different and you don't like it but yeah. i played a system that at the time i thought was bad and is still bad uh <laughs> um so as a result i like i play shadow run anarchy because it's um it's easy like mm -hmm. it's uh condensing i don't know if either of you are familiar with shadow run fifth edition um in that it's it's a big franchise it's running on it's been running for oh, yeah. almost as long as D, D has but fifth edition is super crunchy it's real mathsy and yeah. i'm not about that life that's so, what i heard mm -hmm. so shadowrun cuts out a lot of that chaff uh and kind of essentializes a lot of things but it's not perfect like they released that book there is still a handful of like various mechanics errors in it small ones or uh ideas and mechanics from the main series that were then not properly adapted into anarchy and it seems that after releasing that book they're not really talking or thinking about that book anymore so it's really flawed oh. <laughs> which is okay you oh, know? We all. <laughs> yeah yes we are all definitely very flawed um which is fine but it does mean that it's like i i i use it and i know it well but i don't love it necessarily mm -hmm. uh so part of my um adventures in doing uh, actual play podcasting is trying lots of other systems especially other cyberpunk systems to see if they handle those ideas in the same or a more interesting way um there is one system uh that i came across via kickstarter called axon punk uh its gimmick is that it's both cyberpunk and hip-hop um, huh. it's, it's got like musical influences to it in a mechanics way as well as a theming way uh the primary aspect of it is rhythm so uh the way that teamwork things work in dungeons and dragons for example is if you help another person that other person the person who's choosing to help the main lead doesn't really have to do anything the person who's the lead just gets advantage on the role and that's how they make it kind of like as simple as possible really right. as far mm -hmm. as i understand or at least that's how my dm does it i'm not quite sure if that's necessarily rules is written so yeah, rules is written. Uh, the help action allows you to lend your aid to another creature in order to complete a task. And so when you take the help action, the creature you aid gains advantage on the next ability check it makes to perform the tasks you are helping with, provided that it makes the check before the start of your next turn. Alternatively, you can aid a friendly creature in attacking a creature within five feet of you. You faint, distract the target, or in some other way, team up to make your ally's attack more effective. If your ally attacks the target before your next turn, the first attack roll is made with advantage. So basically, yes, use the help action in order to just provide advantage for one of your allies. What we usually do is we ask the player who is trying to help in what way they're actually helping with the task or something like that. I'm assuming, though, you're bringing this up because of how it works in another system. The way it works in Axon Punk is that there is a stat called Rhythm that is your teamwork stat. And somebody takes point as normal. Everybody rolls dice. Uh, it's a D100 system. So everybody rolls essentially 2D10. Uh, and it factors in the person who rolled the highest. And then also everybody's rhythm stat. And every point in the stat you have is worth like 10, 20, or 30. So it means if all of you are designed to do teamwork well, you can actually, you will succeed more, like statistically, if you work together than if you work alone. And then people go like, oh, then surely you just use teamwork all the time to get stuff done. Yeah, nerd. That's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> You're like, why else do you think we're here? <laughs> and I really like that, especially since um, to do a teamwork role, you have to describe how you're helping and then the outcome of that on the other side and uh that alone is one of the things that drew me like so heavily towards axon punk as a system um i uh have actually kind of like spoken to the devs directly um being oh, wow. kind of like oh yeah i actually really enjoy your system it's really cool and then like uh in real life rhythm rolls occurred and then suddenly i wrote a scenario for them and run it and stuff like that so uh, I guess in that sense, at the moment, Axon Punk is my favorite system. Um, a, because it kind of thematically does what I want, and B, they've paid me to write a thing for them. So, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, like, there's so many other systems that I've, like, looked at and been like, this could be my favorite. Like, Inspectors is really cool. It's basically uh, Ghostbusters, the RPG, uh, where you you team up to deal with paranormal occurrences and there is a system in that game 
where you have like diary room, like looking at the camera, talking about the thing that's happened, like any reality TV show thing. And I think that mechanic's super cool. And they love that. That's really neat. Um, I have recently been looking at Breakfast Cult, um, which is a fate based system that is a bunch of teens go to an occult high school and trouble occurs. And that system actually is really based in anime, which is a thing that I enjoy. Um, anime trash. And like so RPGs I, I really stuff. like that you've carefully dodged actually answering the question. I respect yep. it. Uh, okay, sure. Good that's good. fine. No, good okay, no, okay. <laughs> that's not real then. I can um, phrase it for you differently if you'd like, which would no, be... No, no. My favorite RPG system to play, I think, at the moment is definitely Axon Punk in that it ticks okay. a lot of mechanical and thematic boxes for me. But who knows <laughs> where in the future that might go. Like, you know, you'll just try a system on Kickstart one day and then just get heart eyes all over it. So, <laughs> at the time, that is now my answer. At the time of recording, this might yes. change by the time of release. Who knows? All right. I'm so, <laughs> aren't we all? I don't know. Maybe not Tony. Tony's pretty um, system monogamous so far. I okay. mean, I know it very well. <laughs> yeah. So... You decided to go with the expert rather than the generalist approach. Yeah, for the most part. So last question, which is usually the hardest for people. Do you have a favorite moment, either as a DM or as a player? Actually, this one's relatively easy. Awesome. <clears throat> I'm ready. <laughs> okay, so uh, one of my sessions was a noir murder mystery. Oh. It was set in a, a town in Liverpool that's been walled off, and the company essentially owns the city and is doing various... Uh, like social engineering betterment experiments to kind of make the place better run and drop its crime rate. And uh, as part of the community well-being, they have hired some guest DJs to kind of talk about their community efforts from outside. And it turns out that these guest DJs are my runners for this <gasps> session. Who would have thought? Yeah, who would have thought? You know, <laughs> plot convenience. Um, yeah, so they have to both investigate these weird murders that are going on in the city but also kind of live up to their job as being radio DJs and uh, they both handled I had two players for that session they both handled it that in very very different ways uh, one player uh, Ray who is the GM on Dark Tales of Dark Dragons Inn <laughs> Tales, um, Tales from the Dark Dragons. Tales from the Dark from Dragons. Dark Dragon. <laughs> I, I flub it every time. Like, yes, uh, so do I. I, I, I have to check it and I'm like, Tales as in Dragon's Tale, not the story of a dragon from mm -hmm. the Dark Dragons. And there's dragon. no apostrophe in dragons. That also gets me a handful of times. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. But yes, uh, he like was like, oh, I'm going to like actively wind up the company. And I'm like, that's great. Cool. <laughs> do that. Um, the, the, other, the other player um, who plays Papaya, um, she is a fastinista. Papaya doesn't talk to the help. Um, she has a drone uh, that follows her around taking pictures. Uh, she has three million followers on Instagram. She's my favorite. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll say that Papaya is my favorite. Um, but she, the the player Alicia, um, did an off the cuff rap for her on air segment. Oh my gosh. Wow. And that was the sit like the, the rap was incredibly whack. It was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but and was kind of the point. But you know, to have the stones to oh live God. rap on a thing that goes out on the internet <laughs> is so incredibly effing cool that it was like, ah, oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. You move my heart. So yes, that is definitely my favorite thing as a as a GM. Uh, to for for a player to have done that for just my well being, her well being, yeah. the internet's well being. Yeah, for the good of the world, like really, mm -hmm. for everyone mm -hmm. out there, all of us. Yeah, I, I think that's my solid answer. Unless you want me to kind of give one like as a, a player highlight of a thing that I've done. We I give don't you know. the option if you have one you want to share. Oh, um, yeah, cool, because it gives you <laughs> the opportunity to be a, a, a filthy self promoter. Well, not self promoter, promoting a friend. Um, See, then, then there's no yeah, filter. So yeah. um, there, uh, a, a friend of mine uh, is working on a tabletop RPG based around the Mega Man Battle Network games, um, which is uh, a thing of uh, various preteens <laughs> and teens fight cybercrime using AI fighting buddies. Um, 
And <clears throat> like Mega Man, or like the main Mega Man like video game series, all the bosses and characters are X Man, and that is like their element and ability. And uh, my character that I made for the kind of it's currently going through alpha test demos, so hopefully sometime soon, though an actual like PDF release to the public will release, and that will be very exciting. Um, <laughs> But uh, my character was a 10-year-old photographer called Mosley, and his, like, AI buddy was, like, a, a vaporwave, like, stone statue um, artist Photoshop assistant called Masterpiece.exe, <laughs> uh, who carried around a gigantic paintbrush like a broadsword uh, and was just generally um, assisting in as weird a way as possible like not necessarily refusing to use the combat system because i'm not that barbarian but finding ways to kind of use the combat system in a way that's very loose and uh -huh. narrative focused um it's like okay so since i have a giant paintbrush that means i can like sample colors from the arena and paint things in camo or like somebody's turned invisible so i'm going to turn my paintbrush into a giant ink pen and start ink all over them so <laughs> And it was just, um, we, we did a scenario where somebody like made, we were fighting on top because all the battles take place on the internet. So the spaces can be all very um, abstract. And we were doing a test boss battle in an arena that was a gigantic birthday cake. Um, so it was like paint sampling like the candles around this arena and then painting uh, really elaborate structures in candy striped pink and white just to kind of like annoy the boss that we were fighting, stopping them from moving around. And it was just so much fun. <laughs> just, like, like, there are rules like, to this game. I don't care. <laughs> You're like, I would like to generally be a nuisance to our antagonist. Uh, that seems like a good use of my time. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was effective. It was definitely <laughs> effective. <laughs> uh, yeah, just kind of like uh, opportunities where I have the freedom to do things like that. Um, it resolved that we trapped them inside the cake in the end. Um, we used a special ability to repair damaged arena and like broke the arena, pushed the boss inside of it and sealed the cake back up. And that was, that was beautiful. You know, that was heartwarming. <laughs> oh my goodness, this is part really where you like, realize like, I'm going to be de DMing for you soon. And I'm like, am I ready? Oh my gosh. Oh my you, gosh. <laughs> you're, you're ready. I, 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 I tend to operate within, since that was a test scenario, I was pushing how far we, we could mm -hmm. take that system narratively. Um, because I'm a team player and know that you have to kind of edit a podcast down. I am not going to be difficult. I am a right. person. <laughs> well, nothing difficult, just pushing limits. Well, thank you again for joining us, Nathan. And everyone, don't forget to check out all of Nathan's projects. But for now, here's a promo for the Talent Agency. Do you work in the arts and entertainment industry? Do you have a problem going on within your company that would be a PR nightmare to solve? If so, then you need the helping hand of the Talent Agency, a shadow runner for hire outfit. Operating from an abandoned husk of a television studio on the London South Bank, we offer a crack team of professionals to ensure your next magnum opus goes smoothly. You can hire runners like an orc who wants to be a super sentai hero, a hacker who has coined the term cyberlesque, a bouncer with an encyclopedic knowledge of K-pop choreography, and many more. If you need an example of our work, please listen to the recordings of our successful missions, available on Podbean, iTunes, and most neural interface feeds. Just search for The Talent Agency. The Talent Agency, your one-stop shop for queer cyberpunks who do crimes.